Welcome into another Lion Legend feature. Today, we're catching up with a former UNA great, Robert Steele, played football at North Alabama from 1974 to 1977, went on to become North Alabama's first football player to play in the Super Bowl with the Dallas Cowboys, a two-time All-Goal South Conference selection and a member of the All-Decade team while he was at North Alabama. Robert, thanks for coming to Brawley Stadium to catch up with us today. And thank you so much. I uh, have been watching... Uh, with, uh, with, with almost anxious anticipation. When in the heck are they going to call me? <laughs> well, we're certainly glad to have you here with us today. And we like to start all these out with just the simple question. The University of North Alabama, with all the success you've had playing and in business as well, what does the University of North Alabama mean to Robert Steele? I have said this. Dr. Kitts has heard me say this. Uh, Dr. Carnes, everybody. UNA made me who I am. And I will say that without hesitation. I would not be Robert Steele without the University of North Alabama. A native of Columbus, Georgia, let's jump into your story. Take us back to Hardaway High School. In, in your high school playing days, early athletic career, what kind of athlete were you? Not very good. I didn't even get to play a down my freshman year. I did not play football my sophomore year. I didn't play a down my junior year. And I was frustrated and upset. I was underdeveloped. I weighed about 150 pounds. And I went back out. We had a, uh, a coaching change for my senior year. And, and it worked out because uh, the coach that, um, similar to a lot of experiences for a lot of athletes, uh, the coach that was there did not believe that I was talented enough to play on any team. So we had a coaching change and it allowed me to uh, get to play. I, I, they put me in as tight end. They knew I could catch the ball, but they had, we had two great receivers and one went to Florida A&M and the other one went to Georgia and I ended up going, coming to North Alabama. So I got to play, I caught 25 passes my, uh, my senior season, the only year I got to step on the field. So a breakout season leads you to North Alabama in 1974. What was the recruitment journey to campus like? It's really funny. Uh, my head coach, uh, Fred Marceau, uh, took uh, Jesse Murray, who was the receiver, Mike McGlamory, he went to Wake Forest, and they wanted all three of us to try to come as a package. Well, these guys were stars. I was not. Uh, they offered us all three scholarships. I was the only one that accepted. And it was funny on the, the, the drive back, uh, Fred Marceau actually borrowed my dad's car to drive up here for the recruiting trip. That was the, that was the funny sidebar that I've totally almost forgot about. So you arrive on campus in 74, Mickey Andrews was the head mm -hmm. coach. Take us back to what campus was like when you first got to Florence. So I gotta, I gotta tell you, uh, I had never been away from home. I became extremely homesick. In fact, so much so, that I tried to quit about 10 times. I ended up finding James Lattimore, who was a linebacker at the time, and I, he was from Columbus, Georgia. So I had an instant connection with James, and I literally said to James, James, I hate this place. I absolutely have to go. And after you know, a few conversations, he finally said, you know, Robert, I get it. I know that you don't wanna be here. And why don't you just, uh, why don't you just stick it out to Saturday? And if you don't, if you don't like it past Saturday, then I'll help you pack your bags. Well, he was never being honest about that because he never helped me pack my bags. Uh, he kept me there long enough until we, the, the team went down to Southeastern Louisiana to play the first game of the season. And uh, Coach Gaskell looked at me and said, Robert, why don't you go home, go see your family, Let's get past this uh, feeling that you're having. And can you come back and be ready to play some football? I said, yes, sir, coach, I'll do just that. So I, I did and uh, came back and I got to travel with the team. I actually got to catch a few passes my freshman uh, season. It was, not a, it, it was certainly not an, uh, uh, an all-star type of, of debut, but I was, I was so underdeveloped. I was so not ready for college both physically or academically. I really was a zero, and I mean that sincerely. Four catches, 45 yards that freshman year. Mickey Andrews was your head coach, went on to be the long-term defensive coordinator for Bobby Bowden. We're gonna talk about a lot of the coaches mm -hmm. you've been affiliated with, but Mickey Andrews, uh, what was he like as your head ball coach? So kind of like most head coaches, uh, and I'll share this later when we talk about Coach Landry, but most head coaches, 
uh, they leave the position coaching to the position coaches, which I think is like a CEO would do. Uh, and so I had most of my experiences with Coach Gaskell, and he was the one that really mentored me and really supported me, promoted me, uh, and encouraged me to the point where if there is one person in my life that changed my life is Coach Richie Gaskell. So let's talk more about your career. 1976, your breakout season, 30 catches, 566 yards, five touchdowns, a second team all goal South Conference pick. You said you struggled early on. What started clicking for you? Well, you're going to be surprised when I say this. Uh, I had my uh, left knee blown out uh, by a cheap shot linebacker, you know, crazy guy. Uh, and I ended up having to have surgery uh, my freshman spring. I went through the surgery. Uh, there was a surgeon here on campus. Uh, and Bob Martin was a, a, a tight end at the time. He ended up getting operated on. He blew his knee out about the same time. He, he was operated on by a guy named Dr. Hatchett, believe it or not. When I told my mom that Dr. Hatchett wanted to see me, she said, uh, no way, no, no nothing. <laughs> she used different words. And uh, she said, you're coming to Columbus, Georgia. You're going to see Dr. Jack Houston, friends of ours, and you're going to get the surgery done here. I had the surgery done here, and I was fortunate enough that it was over the top good. Uh, get to campus uh, for my sophomore season, and I'm favoring my left knee and putting more pressure on my right knee. And about halfway through the season, uh, I, I holler out to Coach Gaskell. I said, my, he said, why are you limping? I said, Coach, my knee hurts. He says, you're good. He hollers across the state, you know, the field. Your good knee, your bad knee. I said, my good knee. He goes, <laughs> I got to say it just like he said it. And so uh, I went and had surgery again. Here's the outcome. I was so underdeveloped, so weak, so not ready. 16 weeks on crutches for two surgeries. I couldn't bench press 100 pounds before I was on crutches. If you think about all the stairs around uh, campus, and being on crutches for 16 weeks on this campus, guess what I could bench press without lifting a weight after my crutches? 250. And I didn't lift a pound through that. My body developed. I actually got faster as a result of the knee surgeries. Typically in college, and you guys know this, you, you know, you've talked to a bunch of guys. You have your first knee surgery in college, you're done. You have your second knee surgery, you're really done. And in fact, I was so thankful that Coach Gaskell and, and, and Coach Andrews didn't cut my scholarship because I was a zero. I was still a zero. Show up on um, uh, campus uh, for that junior season, which is your question. I had to give you the backdrop. Uh, but you asked the question, and, and I was ready to play because I was stronger, I was faster, I knew I could catch. Uh, I just needed the time on the field. I had not had any time on the field. Think about it. I played one season in high school. I didn't have the experience that every other kid that comes on this campus had. One season, 10 games. That's all I had. And a couple of catches my freshman year. I don't even think, did I have a catch my sophomore year? I didn't have it on there. I don't think I did. So, um, you know, come to my junior season, I'm ready to play ball. And Coach Gaskell knew I was ready to play ball. And he, you know, I became this, you know, Roger Ralph, thank goodness, he, he, he graduated. And it left a spot for me. And I was able to step right in and, and become the player that I knew I could become. Outstanding season as a junior. Then Wayne Grubb takes over in 1977. Uh, UNA fans very familiar with Coach Grubb. Another coach in your long list of coaches. What was Coach Grubb like for you? Uh, can I be really honest? By all means. Coach Grubb did not like me. In fact, he, he did not speak to me. He spoke to my date at the senior athletic banquet. He did not speak to me standing right next to me. He, there were some, I don't know if it was personality or whatever, but let me, let me give you the last fact. 
Terry Witherspoon, uh, who you, I think, have interviewed, and um, Lynn Harvey and a few other guys were going to go to Atlanta for the tryout camp that year. And Spoon wanted me to uh, drive because uh, I had a car and I was willing to pay for the gas. And uh, I, went to coach, uh, I went to Coach Grubb and I said, Coach Grubb, Spoon wants me to go to Atlanta to the tryout camp. I, I, I'd like your opinion. Well, I didn't go there for a beatdown. I went there for words of encouragement. So he says, Robert, come into my office. So he sits me down, looks me square in the eye, he says, Robert, aren't you getting ready to graduate? He said, I said, yes, sir. He said, tryout camps are all about speed and you're slow. You're gonna come in last in every drill. He said, you got okay hands, you're an okay athlete, but you got a, you're gonna, you got a degree. Put football out of your mind forever. And I said, so my question to you, what did I do? Went to work. No, I took his advice. I didn't go to the tryout camp. I sat at home. Two weeks later, Coach Grubb was off campus. Uh, Bill Baker, the offense coordinator was, and y Walt Jaworski shows up on campus and says, uh, I've been scouting Robert Steele for you know two seasons and uh, I'd like to put him through some trials. Well, Coach Grubb got me off of, I was in, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a superstars competition on campus that year. And I, I was actually put up by the Zetas, not by the Fijis that were my boys. And uh, so I had something to prove to them. And so I'm in the middle of the superstars competition and Coach uh, uh, Baker says, Robert, I need you to be on the field. Uh, Mr. Jaworski's here, would like to put you through some time trials. I ran a, and the football field had not been cut for like six weeks. I ran a 4640. I had never been timed faster than a 48. So Jaworski goes up and measures the 40 yards and says, Robert, I, 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 you're not this fast. I must have only marked off 35. And he marks off the 30, the 40, and he says, Dang, you 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 ran a 46. He said, Turn around, let's run it the other way. Ran a 46. Turn around, run it again. Run a 46. Turn around another again. And he said, and you know, I was not truthful to this. He says, Robert, you're not supposed to be this fast. Uh, what have you been doing? I said, I've been working my butt off trying to get ready, which was not a true statement. I, it was my senior year in college and I'd, you know, I'd put football behind me. Two weeks later, I get a phone call. Uh, I'm sorry, I get a, I get a letter in the mail uh, from the Cowboys and says, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at you. And, uh, and I thought it was just this generic letter and long story short, uh, I, I didn't get drafted. I signed a free agent contract and showed up to training camp and the rest is history. So before we dive into the Cowboys, you, you wrap up playing football at North Alabama and baseball fit into the equation at some point, correct? What's the baseball's part of this story? Um, I, uh, I went to uh, uh, Coach Jones and I said, I'd like to play baseball. And he said, you know, you can't, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've got to play spring ball. And I said, I'm, they, they won't let me play spring ball. They don't want me to get hurt again. So I went to Coach Gaskell and I said, you know, uh, I, I want to play pro, because I had actually been offered a pro baseball con a contract my freshman season. And I turned it down because I was just coming off the rehab. But um, uh, long story short, I, um, I, I convinced Coach Gaskell to let me play baseball my junior season. And I had a not a great season. I... Um, Coach Jones, a great guy, great coach, great, great, great. But he was a pitcher for the Boston Red Sox. He did not know how to teach me hitting. And I started struggling. Uh, I hit some really long balls, but I also had struggle with the curveball. And so I was a great first baseman. Uh, and I, felt, you know, I could catch anything that came my way. And, uh, and, and I, I played first base and, 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 again, struggled at the plate. And so I didn't, I didn't want to, because Coach Jones was still there, I love Coach Jones, but uh, I knew I wasn't going to improve. And so I decided to play my senior, se my senior spring and just do nothing. 
So you wrap up at North Alabama, and let's jump into the journey with the Dallas Cowboys. Coming off of a Super Bowl win the year prior, you end up in training camp with the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. You look at some of the names, Roger Staubach, Tony Dorsett, Drew Pearson, mm -hmm. defense that featured Ed Tutal Jones, Randy White. What was it like for you coming from North Alabama, going to training camp with the defending Super Bowl champions? So I got to tell you, and, and I got plenty of stories, but the, 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 the one story I need, I need to share is I, I had no experience uh, uh, with the NFL. I, that was not my lifelong dream. I got a dream I got to tell you. And I, so I knew no one in my life that played for the, in the NFL. So I knew that Harlan had played in the NFL and I went to Jerry and I said, Jerry, can, can I get 10 minutes with your dad? Because he played in the NFL, and I don't know your dad, but I'd like to meet him and just see if he would give me 10 minutes of his time. Jerry set it up. We went out to Brooks High School, sat on the bleachers and, and Harlan, and I got, I got to tell you, this was, I, I thought he was going to take me on the field and show me some moves and try to, you know, do something. He sat down and he talked to me for two hours and just gave me himself, and that was really cool. And so he basically said, Robert, keep your mouth shut and do your job on the field. The best thing he ever said to me, and I did exactly that. He said, they don't want to hear from you. They want to see you on the field performing. So I go to, uh, so I read all the materials. I read about Drew Pearson and, and he came to camp. He came to Dallas before training camp started in Thousand Oaks. And uh, so I went up to uh, Gil Brandt at the, at the rookie orientation and I, I had really good times. I had good numbers on, on the rookie orientation camp. And I went to Gil and I said, uh, Mr. Brandt, um, what does it take to be like Drew Pearson and come to Dallas uh, before training camp? Because I won't make the team without being acclimated. And, and I said, I, I just I read everything that you guys sent me and I know that I can't make it without that. He goes, well, that's Coach Landry's decision. And I said, OK, uh, can I go ask him? And he said, uh, no, I'll take care of that. Well, I was invited because my numbers were so good. I was invited in. And I got to tell you that that six weeks, I worked out 12 hours a day, every day. And, you know, they, they were only open six days. And on the seventh day, I didn't rest. I ran seven miles every Sunday. When I got to training camp, I did not break a sweat. At the end of training camp, well, let me back up. Uh, when I get to training camp, uh, I look at the depth chart. You got Drew Pearson, Golden Richard, starters in Super Bowl 12. You got Tony Hill and Butch Johnson. The Cowboys have always only carried four receivers. I get to training camp, I look at the depth chart, and I am number 20 on the depth chart of 20. Now, Ben, I don't know about you, but that's probably not where you want to start, right? And I looked at the depth chart and I, I swear to you, I smiled and I'm a little, I'm a little wired a little differently, but I smiled and I said, you know what? I got nowhere to go, but up everybody else has got plenty of places to go down. And so from Harlan's coaching and from all of my other experiences, I said, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to catch every pass thrown. I'm going to do everything possible so that they don't cut me first. So we get, uh, we get there, I start, you know, I make the first cut, make the second cut, make the third cut. I go to Ditka and I, so I said, Coach Ditka, um, I, I'm now alternating uh, with Tony Hill as the fifth receiver. Uh, they've already cut, you know, a bunch of people in front of me. Uh, so I, I go to Coach Ditka and I said, Coach, uh, has the, have the Cowboys ever carried five receivers? He said, nope. I said, so what, what can I do? What can I do now to get there? He said, special teams. And of course, Coach Ditka was a special teams coach. And he goes, um, you know, we're going to get ready to play San Francisco, OJ's last season. We're getting ready to play San Francisco at the Cowboys Stadium. And, um, you know, we're going to be working on special teams today. Why don't you um, get out there? Uh, I said, okay, done. And so I get out there for punt. Uh, they're, they're doing uh, punt protection. And so I get on the defensive side and, and uh, Coach um, uh, Stallings comes up to me and says, Robert, get on the left side and block the punt. 
And I did. And I was in Danny White's face within a second. I mean, no kidding. And Landry looks over at Ditka and, and kind of gives him a look. And, uh, and, and I could tell that they were not happy. Stallings is now having fun. He gets me and puts me on the, on the, on the right side. And he says, uh, block it again. So I was in Danny's white, Danny White's face in like a second. And Ditka slams his uh, clipboard to the ground. Landry is going crazy and Stallings is having the time of his life, right? So he sa then says, Robert, do it this time, but go up the middle. So I tried to go up the middle and I was flattened like a pancake. <laughs> but come uh, Saturday night, I'm on the field on all the special teams. Get to the end of training camp, and this is two stories. My book is called Steel Here. We get to the end of training camp. We're getting ready to break camp. I'm still there. And uh, uh, Coach Landry calls a roll. He calls uh, uh, the whole roll, calls Stallback. Stallback says present because of his Navy background. He calls Steel, and I said here, because I didn't want to say uh, present. And back of the room, Drew Pearson goes, Steel here? Why are you Steel here? And Landry started laughing, everybody started laughing, and, uh, and I knew at that moment in time that I, had, I, I was close. So fast forward to another couple of weeks, we, we break camp, we're, we're in Dallas, and um, uh, we're getting ready to play uh, the Baltimore Colts in our first game. And, uh, uh, Dan, uh, and during training camp, when you get cut, uh, they tap you on the foot. They call it the Turk. The Turk taps you on the foot, basically says, uh, Coach Landry wants to see you and bring your playbook. Well, that never happened to me. Gil Brandt calls me up and says, Robert, we're, you know, we're do making some roster changes, and, um, but we're, we got to release you. Uh, and I want you to go home, see your family, and just hang by the phone. Well, I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I'm, I'm a kid. I didn't know what that meant at all. And so I go home. It's hard for a kid to sit for seven days waiting for the phone to ring. So, you know, A, you can't leave the house because there were no cell phones back in the day. And so uh, I did that and then uh, didn't hear a phone call, no phone call. Uh, Monday night shows up, getting ready to play Baltimore and Golden Richards is sitting on his helmet the whole game. He didn't play a down. I looked at my mom and dad and I said, that means something. That is disrespect to Coach Landry and I don't know what's going on, but that, I think that's a good sign for me. Get a phone call the next day from, and by the way, they didn't ask me to bring my playbook to Coach Landry uh, when they, they released me. Ne next day, I get a phone call. Gil Brandt says, Robert, um, congratulations, you're a Dallas Cowboy. Uh, get on an airplane and the rest is history. I need to say one more thing though. When we, right before we broke training camp, Gil Brandt comes up to me and I'd gotten to know all these guys, really love being around them. Had a couple of more stories I could share, but I won't. But Gil Brandt comes up to me and says, Robert, you had a pretty good training camp. And I said, thank you, coach. Um, and I, I called everybody coach. Uh, I said, thank you, sir. Um, I mean, I don't know what that means, but I appreciate that. He said, no, no, no. You had the highest pass catch ratio in the history of Cowboy training camp. And what the Cowboys car carry, you know, they, they, uh, they stat everything. And so they record every time a ball is thrown your way. I mean, even in a, in a drill, even in a flipping it with quarterbacks, they literally stat everything. And he says, you had the highest pass catch ratio in the history of the Cowboys. And I said, thank you very much. And so that plus the special teams play, plus the trade of Golden Richards created a spot for me. So you get to spend that year with the Cowboys. They would go into the Super Bowl. We'll touch on that momentarily, but Tom Landry, Head coach for Dallas, legend, legendary NFL coach, 250 wins, two Super Bowl wins. What was the impact he had as your head coach? So Coach Landry, and I said this kind of earlier about head coaches, I, I respected Coach Landry. Coach Landry um, was the consummate CEO, if you think about that from a business term. Uh, he coached the coaches, and he let the coaches coach the players, which is why most of his coaches – became head coaches themselves, and darn good ones at that. Mike Ditka, Gene Stallings, 
uh, 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 Dan Reeves. I mean, think about the, the legacy that he created. And so I took that philosophy of coaching the coaches as the CEO, and I wrote an article uh, that was actually uh, uh, published in um, uh, Motivated Magazine. Uh, Richard Branson was on the cover, and, and, and I wrote an article. They asked me to write an article about my experiences, and, and I entitled the article, What Landry Reeves and Ditka Taught Me About dot, 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 Business. And I considered that my MBA, if you will. So anyway, that was, that was what I thought of Coach Landry. And, and again, he, he truly was the epitome of a head coach. And we respected uh, him beyond measure. And of course, I loved Coach Ditka. Uh, you know, got plenty of stories about him. Uh, loved Dan Reeves. Uh, I, I, I was accepted even though I was a free agent rookie. I was the only free agent out of 80 players to try out. Um, Brian Billick was one of the tryouts and he didn't make the squad. Uh, but I was the only free agent out of 80 to make the team, uh, four other draft choices. And so, you know, the fab five, as we called ourselves, uh, were, were the, you know, were the rookies that got to play in Super Bowl uh, 13. So you mentioned some great names there. Dan Reeves, offensive coordinator, great NFL career as a head coach. Mike Ditka, everybody knows the Chicago the 80, Bears, the, 85 Bears. The, the run he had, uh, Roger Staubach, the quarterback. Do you ever sit back and just think about, wow, I got to be associated with some of the biggest names in NFL history? People ask me about that. And, and I, and, and I got to tell you, before the um, concussion movie came out, I, I really thought I would play six, seven, eight season. I had the hands. I had the speed. I had the ability. But uh, now, after because I had to play special teams, I got – kicked around a lot. Uh, I was, I, I used to say, you know, I got to play two seasons, I'm thankful for that, but uh, you know, I, I, I had hoped to play longer. And after seeing the concussion movie, I basically said, you know what, I got to play two years and I'm thankful that I did. And of course my final statement is, but when you're 22 years old, what would you rather be doing than playing for the world champion Cowboys? So can I share one more little sidebar? This is a funny sidebar. I wrote the book still here, uh, and not because I was passionate about writing the book. I wrote the book because I was on an airplane, a business trip to San Francisco, and I watched the movie Invincible with, with uh, uh, Mark Wahlberg about Vince Papali. And I watched the movie, and it's an entertaining, it, it's an entertaining movie, but um, when I got off the plane and, and I went to work, and I worked all week, and I got on the plane coming back, I kept thinking about the movie Invincible. And I, and I said, Vince Papali, I mean, great guy, great story, 30-year-old bartender. But he didn't have to make the world champion Dallas Cowboys in 78. He had to make the last place Eagles in Dick Vermeil's first season. So I ended up on nine Delta Airline flights. I wrote the book. And I had to title it Steel Here. And the publisher wanted me to change the title. I said, heck no. It's going to be still here, but nobody will get the story. I said, they will if they read the book. So anyway, that was that. And so I got to meet, uh, I actually went to a, a, an Emmett Smith gala a couple of years ago. Vince Papali was there and I got to meet Vince and we were sharing stories, uh, having fun, talking, you know, as guys do when they get in those uh, moments. And uh, I, I looked at him and I said, you know, Vince, I wrote a book called Steel Here. Um, you know, because, you know, it, you, great story. I said, but, you know, I had to make the world champion Dallas Cowboys. He said, yeah, I got a movie. <laughs> so that, and, and again, I respect him for, for that. Uh, but I do believe that, uh, you know, our stories are very, very similar in terms of, you know, number one, starting out as number 20 on the depth chart. Uh, I was just forced. I really was fortunate. I was at the right place at the right time. I had the, you know, the, the encouragement from uh, all the, uh, the folks in my past and the, the moment of, you know, the moment in time. And I, 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 t I speak about moments in time a lot. The moment in time that Tarlin Hill gave me, uh, you know, at um, a, a Coffee High. Um, I'm sorry, Bradshaw High. Uh, I mean, those moments in time change someone's life. 
I want to talk about Super Bowl 13. You go mm -hmm. through that year with the Cowboys, defending Super Bowl champs, back in the Super Bowl again. They called it the Battle of Champions, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the two teams of the 70s, played in the Orange Bowl. Mm -hmm. Take us back to that. What do you remember about walking on the field, preparing for arguably, you know, the biggest game in America? It, it, it was a heady experience. I got to say that. Um, uh, again, I kept taking uh, Harlan's advice. I did not run my mouth. I didn't speak to anybody for most of the whole season. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be a part. And, uh, and so much so, and I got to tell you this uh, little sidebar, uh, about halfway through, and I didn't end up holding in the, in the Super Bowl, but uh, about a third of the way through the season, uh, Charlie Waters comes up to me and says, um, I need you to be out at practice earlier uh, and uh, you're going to be, uh, you need to work on holding uh, for Rafael Septien. I said, I'm not coming anywhere. That's Coach Landry's decision. He said, I've already talked to Coach Landry. You got better hands than I do. You're going to be holding on Sunday. I said, oh my gosh. You're, you're... And so I ended up holding for most of the season. Um, they ended up putting Charlie in the Super Bowl. Uh, uh, I ended up getting a penalty uh, against the Atlanta Falcons in the uh, NFC Championship game, and, and I was punished for the for the penalty uh, and was r relieved of my holding duties. But uh, again, I, it was such a heady experience getting to play in the Super Bowl. And I got another sidebar. You know, we picked up Jackie Smith, and most everybody remembers Jackie Smith um, uh, dropping the pass. Well, Mike Ditka comes up to me. Uh, early December and he says, Robert, I need to speak to you. And I said, what's it about coach? He said, well, you know, Jay Saldy broke his hand. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, we thought about putting you in as tight end, but you know, you're just not that big. Uh, and we picked up Jackie Smith and I said, okay, what does that have to do with me? He said, well, we picked up Jackie Smith. I said, okay, what does that have to do with me? He said, well, Jackie Smith wore number 81 uh, for the St. Louis Cardinals for 19 seasons. And I said, stop right there, Mike. I said, as long as I have a jersey with a number on it, cleats in the locker and, a, and still on the team and my name on the, on the locker, I can be 181. I don't care. Let Jackie Smith have 81. And so Jackie Smith ended up and I had people thought I dropped the pass because I wore number 81 for most of the season, right? Five years ago, I, Jackie Smith reached out to me and asked me to help his son on some stuff. And uh, we were back and forth emailing. He sent me an email and he said, uh, you know, Robert, thanks for your help, blah, 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 blah. And he ended it, Jackie Smith, your friend, number 81, because you let me be. That's pretty, that's the kind of experience that you want from the players that you play with. And, and, and I, I got along with all the players. So the Steelers would win that win 35-31. Terry Bradshaw, MVP, all the Hall of Famers in that game. Chuck Noll versus Tom Landry. Take us to Super Bowl Sunday. What else do you remember about the game? What stands out? It was a, it was a battle. It's probably still one of the top 10 Super Bowls in Super Bowl history. Uh, we, we, I did get to play. Uh, kind of another uh, story is um, uh, uh, Drew Pearson went down uh, needed a break. I went out for a play. It was a pass play. I'm running a, you know, down and out, uh, a, a three pattern, which is down and out 15 yards or down across the middle 15 yards. And um, Roger looks at me. He looks at over at Tony Hill in the corner. He looks back at me, looks back at Tony Hill, and then literally looking at me, throws the ball to Tony Hill. He's got 14, you know, D-backs on him. And uh, I didn't say anything to Roger at the time. It wasn't my place. And so, but about three months later, we're at the, the Ken Cooper Clinic there, in, you know, playing basketball and goofing off. And I looked up at Roger as we took a break and I said, Roger, you've thrown to me a thousand times. I caught every one of them. Why didn't you throw to me? I, I was open, I was open. And I told him the story about, he said, yeah, no, I wasn't expecting you to be there. And again, we just had that kind of relationship, but it, it, was, it was a great game. It was back and forth. Uh, you know, obviously we had some great plays. We had some, uh, some, some plays where, you know, Benny Barnes got tripped up and Lynn Swan made a catch. And I mean, it was, it was a battle and it was really the battle of the best two teams in the NFL at that, that season. And 
you know, the Jackie Smith, no one play wins or lose, typically doesn't win or lose any game. And I, and I will submit, Jackie Smith did not cause us to lose that game. Uh, it was a combination of a whole bunch of back and forth and two battling, you know, titans, if you will. Uh, and, and the Pittsburgh Steelers were the uh, victor. You go on to play one more season in the NFL, the Minnesota Vikings. Another great coach, Bud Grant, up in Minnesota. NFL fans will be familiar, familiar with him. But that one year up in Minnesota, what are some things that you remember? So here's the deal. I set two goals. And I'm, I, I, most everybody who knows me, know me knows me that I am pretty candid. I speak my mind. And uh, I got to Minnesota, and I tried to fit in. Uh, they did not accept me because I came from the Cowboys. They still have the, you know, the Cowboys uh, Vikings rivalry in their mind. And, but I had a backup. I set two goals for myself when I signed my contract. I wanted to make the Dallas Cowboys and I wanted to get a game ball. I wanted to win a game ball. So I didn't, you know, I didn't play as, you know, I didn't actually get a pass thrown my way uh, my first season with the Cowboys. Get to Minnesota. Uh, I did play a little bit more as receiver. I got to catch, played all the special teams. I made one catch my whole NFL career. Had, you know, so, Tom Brookshire said that uh, he came up to me on the sideline or, uh, in, uh, before the, one of the games, and he said, Robert, rumor has it you have the best hands on the team. And why are they not throwing to you? I said, well, that's Coach Landry's decision. No, no, no. You have, I've, everybody around here knows you have the best hands on the team. Why are they not throwing to you? And I, I knew where he was headed with this. And I said, sir, I've got a ball game to prepare for. That is, why don't you ask Coach Landry that question? I appreciate you asking him that question, but that's not a question for me to answer. And I knew what he wanted to get. But anyway, I get to, you know, I got to play, got one pass thrown my way, made the catch. So I'm one for one, I got to tell you that. And, uh, but uh, we're getting ready to play Tampa Bay. And I'm, we're getting ready, you know, we're towards the end of the season and I wanted to, I still wanted a game ball. I ended up rushing up the middle, blocked a punt, set up the game winning touchdown and was awarded a game ball. Uh, and and I, I will say this being honest, I set two goals for myself. Today in business, I know what I, the mistake I made. I only set two goals. When I accomplished that second goal of getting the game ball, I should have set another goal and then another goal, and I didn't. And I believe football was taken away from me as a result of that, and that's just being honest. That season ends, uh, the last season you would play. What was next for you? So I ended up uh, tr you know, going back to try and uh, finish the team, uh, you know, uh, uh, make my third season with the, uh, with the Vikings. I ended up getting released at the end of training camp. There's a story there, but I'm not going to go into it. Uh, and then the next, I sit out that season and then Dan Reeves goes to Denver, tries to, you know, uh, takes me out there, pulled a hamstring. I never pulled a hamstring in my life. Never really, other than my knees, I never had any injuries. Uh, pulled a hamstring day before training camp opened. Three days later, I go to uh, Dan and I say, Dan, you know, you can't make the club in the tub, uh, send me home. He did. And, and I put football behind me. I got into the insurance business. I got my COU, got my CHFC you know, did, I put the same passion in that industry that I put into making the Cowboys. Uh, and so uh, I had a dinner with Mike Ditka probably five years ago also. And I sat down with him and I said, coach, I'm really mad with you. He said, what are you mad with me for? I said, if you had gone to the bears in 81 rather than 82, I'd have been a bear. He kind of laughs, you know how he is. He goes, you're right. He took Jay Saldy with him and uh, he said, yeah, you'd have been a bear. So anyway, I, I loved every player, every guy. I loved everybody. It was just such a great personal experience. And I got to tell you, and this is part of the end of the story. When I made the Dallas Cowboys, my life forever changed. And of course, I said in the very beginning, I became a Dallas Cowboy because of UNA. UNA gave me my experience. UNA matured me as a person. I got my degree. I was uh, on the uh, uh, Dean's List uh, 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 six of my eight semesters. And I love my time here. That's so much so that I'll never, ever have UNA not in my life. 
So you begin a great business career in 2017. The Steel Center for Professional Selling is, is named after your father, I believe. All the success in business and, and the, the NFL run, the Super Bowl football at, at UNA, but that right there, what was that like for you? So Dr. Kitts uh, approached me with, you know, naming it the Robert H. Steel Center for, for Professional Selling. And I said, no, I don't want it named after me. And he came back another time, uh, came back another time. And I kept saying, no, no, no. And they finally convinced me that, you know, to do it. And basically they said, Robert, you don't understand. Uh, you know, we want you involved. And this is, this is a legacy kind of thing. This, is, this, this will always be the steel, you know, the Robert A. Steel Center. So they named it the Robert A. Steel Center and did a plaque, did everything. And, thir you know, 30, 45 days later, I, I call up, uh, you know, the, the university and I said, we got to change the name. It can't be, I didn't even name my son after me. I said, it can't be the Robert A. Steel Center. I just, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. I wanted to be the steel center in honor of my father because he was the best salesman that I ever met. So the underdog story continues from playing college football at UNA to the NFL to the Georgia State Legislature. What's the story behind that in your run? So I got involved in the Republican Party. And again, I, um, I, I don't look at things as right and left. I look at things as right or wrong. And so I wanted to get involved. I wanted to do public service. And I ended up uh, getting involved in the Republican Party from 1980 and uh, ended up going through the chairs at, you know, with the Republican Party, became county party chairman for two terms. And as I tend to do from time to time, got on a podium and said something really stupid. I said, if we don't find someone to beat who's in office, I will run. And of course, then they put me to the test and made me run. Ended up winning the campaign. Uh, I beat a, a, a person that it was 12 year incumbent and it had an 86% approval rating. Uh, ended up winning the election 5248 and uh, served, uh, served a two year term and went for reelection and, and, and was defeated. I will say this, I loved the running part. I didn't love the serving part. You had every group in the world, uh, Georgia, uh, trying to get you to meet with them, to hear their issues, to help them get their funding and all those things. And you basically put your business career, you're making $12,000 a year as a state legislator, and you have 24 seven access from people that want to talk to you. So your business career goes, on hold. So I didn't enjoy the serving part. I loved the, the, the running part. So I want to wrap up with just two questions. Uh, you've mentioned it throughout this interview, still here in Underdog's Secret to Success, uh, the book you wrote uh, several years back. You've talked about it a lot, teased some stories. What's something else UNA fans might be interested in that book if they haven't read it? Ah, great question. Um, there, there are, it's, it's actually not as much about sports as you would think. It is more about business and life. And I, I do talk about uh, some of the stories of, of what, you know, coach, the, the influence of Coach Landry and Coach Ditka and Stahlback and, and Gil Brand and all the others. But I, I think the, maybe the one takeaway is if, if you want something bad enough and truly put your mind and your heart and your soul into it, you can accomplish it. And I was not supposed to make the Dallas Cowboys. I was not supposed to play at UNA. I was not supposed to do a lot of things. But once I learned that truth, which is most people don't accomplish the things that they want because they don't want it bad enough. Once you have set that as your focal point, and your focus, and you commit yourself 100%, and you are passionate about that, you will accomplish that. So we'll end this Lion Legend with this. Uh, talk about Harlan Hill, 
the first great UNA football player to come through a great run with the Chicago Bears. You become the first of five UNA players to play in the Super Bowl. And between Harlan and you, not, not very many people got a taste of the NFL. So you play Super Bowl 13. UNA football starts to take off in the 80s, the championship run of the 90s. Great dominant run in Division II, now taking the step to Division I. Being associated with the long football legacy at North Alabama, I know you, you mentioned you didn't want your name on, on the, 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 the building at North Alabama, but being associated with all of that, just how special is your journey? Well, my journey is, is no more special than any other journey. Uh, Roger Ralph was a superstar at UNA. He deserved to be in the NFL far more than I did. Uh, so many other players. Terry Witherspoon should have been in the NFL. Lynn Harvey could have been in the NFL. I mean, there were so many players that could have, should have, would have played uh, in the NFL. I just happened to be, and I said this earlier, happened to be at the right place at the right time. And what I do hope and believe is that I might have just opened the floodgates a little bit because Brad Hendricks came in uh, the next year, a few more players, and Jerry Hill, and, and, and the rec I, I just think, the, um, hopefully, that my making the Cowboys at that moment in time uh, allowed UN, uh, UNA to get the credit for putting great football players on the field and graduating great students uh, to go on to do great things in life. So I. I'm humbled to be a part of this university. I will always be a part of this university. And I said this before, I'll say it a, a thousand more times. I am one small you know, cog in this really large wheel of life. And UNA, I, I'm so proud that I'm a part of that and this university. And as, as I've said before, Dr. Kitts, and Richie Gaskell and all the people that have been in my life uh, in the past and you know through through the rest of my life, uh, I want to be a part of this university. Robert, we certainly appreciate the time. Thank you for being a Lion Legend. Thank you, sir.